All wise God, open our ears to hear the words that challenge and the words that bless. As we read the scripture, may your spirit of wisdom move in our midst. For this we give you honor and thanks and praise. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from Micah 6. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. O my people, what have I done to you, and what have I wearied you? Answer me, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam, son of Baor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Galgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? This is a reading from 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 31. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved by it, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the scribe, and the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards, Not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in that order. As it is written, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Well, in our First Corinthians scripture today, Paul is talking about wisdom, particularly comparing the wisdom of God with the wisdom of the world. Now, the wisdom of the world has certain things that it cares about. It cares about power. It cares about status. It cares about feeding our ego and about scapegoating others. And the wisdom of the world uses violence. Now, 
Think of some of the ways we might say what the wisdom of the world is. We might say a phrase like, get yours while you can, right? Does that sound like the wisdom of the world? Uh, how about that riches or success are a, are a sign of favor or maybe even a sign of God's favor? Does that sound like the wisdom of the world? How about that we're looking for one that makes us feel successful, that we're winning so that we can feel strong and powerful. That's the voice of the wisdom of the world. You might also think that bigger, bigger is better or that size matters or last week it was crowd size that mattered. <laughs> the wisdom of the world. This has been going on forever, of course. It's early on in Scripture when the Israelites were uh, in the wilderness and they cried out, you know, it would have been better to have stayed slaves in Egypt than for us to die out here in this wilderness. And the food tastes bad too, they said. What the world says is the best will inevitably fall short. It always proves out to be an illusion. And contrast that with God's wisdom. God's wisdom, Paul says, is Christ crucified, which is a stumbling block. Think about, I think if we're honest with ourselves, the Christ that we really want is really not the Christ that's in Scripture. I think that the Christ we want is one who is a champion, one who's victorious, maybe sort of Rambo-esque. Or for some of us, sometimes the Jesus we want might be kind of a snarky Christ. Uh, One who's got the best comeback, a quip that will just cut to the quick and eviscerate our enemies. That might seem like the Christ we would want. Or as maybe is uh, in this stained glass window, maybe this resurrection Jesus is almost, to me, it seems like a, a Terminator Jesus. This is, believe it or not, this is on a cathedral in Houston. It's a blue-eyed Jesus who is buff. If you go and work out, I mean, this, this Jesus is swole, right? Um, now, this is not the Jesus of Scripture, in my opinion. This is not what we get in Scripture. Instead, we get this Christ of the Pieta the crucified Christ, our leader, our God. It's a scandal. It's really kind of offensive when you think about it that our leader, our God, dies, doesn't even pick up a sword. He's a convicted criminal of a public execution. I mean, who would want to follow that as a leader? It's not something people who would want to imitate. There's no army, there's no revolution. And yet Christ teaches us that violence is not the way. That forgiveness teaches us about forgiveness and new life. Teaches us about love and compassion for all and shows us the way that leads to life eternal. It's not about success. It's not about being powerful. The wisdom of God is the wisdom of Christ. So what do we do? We're always wondering about the the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of Christ. I think we need to remember that the world's wisdom and the world's tactics are not to be our tactics. We're to love. We're to serve. We're to sacrifice. We're to welcome And we're to follow in the way of Jesus the Christ crucified. For it's only by dying to self that we will experience resurrection. Now, this week in thinking about the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God, I couldn't help but think of here at the end of the week, dealing with this, the president's executive order. In the eyes of the world... This might be something that would bring security. In the eyes of the world, it might project strength. It might be retribution for past events. 
In the eyes of the world, it separates the good from the evil. But I don't think that that's the way the eyes and the wisdom of God would see it. I think we would confront injustice. We would confront unkindness. I think we would find it lacking in humility. In contrast, I found this icon of Jesus at the border. Christ, who is there and has told us in Matthew, or has told us that uh, whatever you do to the least of them, you do to me. I wonder where Christ is on that border. Is Christ the one who can't get in? Or is Christ the one looking out at those who can't get in? The barbed wire conspicuously there near the wounds of Christ. I think if we're honest again with ourselves, we like to think that we already have the Christ. We already have, you know, it, we already have Christ with us on our side of the border. The wisdom of this world tricks us into thinking we already possess Christ, or that worse, that we stand as Christ's protectors. Perhaps Christ should show us a little gratitude for that, right? But when we welcome the stranger, we're told that we welcome Christ. That's what Matthew 25, 35 says. And if we think of that icon again, maybe we would find ourselves on the other side of the fence from Christ. Here, just yesterday and Friday late, as we experienced uh, folks that were detained at the airport. Wasn't it a wonderful outpouring, I believe, of the wisdom of God, that folks showed up at the airport to be a witness, to protest, to say that they wanted justice to be done, that they wanted people treated humanely and fairly. And so as Christians, we're always called to respond, what can we do? We need to ask for God's wisdom. We need to ask it for us, for ourselves. We need to ask it for our public witnesses. And we need to ask for God's wisdom for those with whom we stand in opposition. We need to give up our own love of triumphalism, our desire to be on the winning side, our desire to be vindicated and proven right. We need to pray instead that love prevails. We need to stand with the strangers, the outcast, and the poor. I want to invite you to consider taking off from work on Tuesday, coming down to church to help us host the Muslim, uh, our Muslim brothers and sisters who are partaking in their advocacy day at the Capitol. This is at least the second year that we've done that, and we've provided a space for them to gather, to organize themselves, a space for them to come back and have lunch and have prayer, a space that's welcoming in contrast to last year's protesters and folks that yelled hateful things. I invite you, and I'll tell you, I don't have a lot of jobs for you to do, but it, come and be ready to, to love, to be a good host, to welcome people, to show them where the bathroom is, and just to let them know that they're welcome here. In the midst of the way the Muslim community is being treated, that's probably just beginning of what we could do. You may be familiar that at Lake Travis, there was a mosque that was under construction that was burned. And just this, at the end of this week in Victoria, Texas, those of you that know Victoria, Texas, could, did you imagine there was a mosque in Victoria, Texas? There was, until a fire burned it down. What are we called to do? To call our state reps and senators on the matters of faith to speak to them about the bathroom bill and about science in our classrooms, about affordable housing, 
continuing to press for inclusion of LGBTQ persons and for marriage equality. And yes, for an appropriate place for prayer and public life. We're to call and write those in our, on the federal level to share the wisdom of God about immigration policy, about health care, the environment, religious liberty, and in the midst of pluralism. But I want to share a word about advocacy as well. Now, when I reflect about times that I've been involved in advocacy, I sometimes find that it doesn't bring out the best in me. I'm, I, I'm likely to demonize the other side. I'm likely to adopt the world's tactics, especially if my opposition acts that way or I judge them to have acted that way. I often adopt a worldly wisdom and use it as the expedient tool and abandon God's wisdom, which seems so foolish at the time and in the halls of power seems so weak. So how can we avoid this? We must base our advocacy on the ways that we are being Christ's servants. We must welcome the stranger into our lives, into our congregation, our community, before we can speak to the matter with wisdom. We must do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly. It all must happen together. Our advocacy must be rooted in our service, our suffering with Christ on the cross, if we're to have hope for the resurrection. Again, I remind you of the things that I often forget. You know, nobody else, nobody sees themselves as evil. Nobody would say that they advocate for what they think is wrong. Our perspectives might be as different as night and day. But when our hearts turn from loving them to wanting to kill them, we have traded the cross of Christ for the false wisdom of the world. You know, the way of Christ is not to be found in self-assurance that one has the right opinions or belief or even theology. The way of Christ is that of love and of servanthood, of suffering with and dying for. This is the manner by which we are to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God. I say with our God, not for our God, not in proof of our God, not so that God will be happy with us or thankful for us. We need to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God, for God is already doing this. Christ is already detained with those at the airports and in their countries of origin. Christ is already on the border with the families who are separated, with the children who are detained, and with the dreamers who live in fear. We need to join with our God in these things. God is already doing justice, already loving kindness, already walking humbly. We need to walk in the way of Christ, the way of the cross. God calls us to join with our God. And do so by the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of the world. Amen.